there's an added very important complexity that the microbiome has that the human genome doesn't have. And that's around this replication and ever-changing thing. And so it's not good enough to get one snapshot in time. You really want to understand what is your baseline microbiome. And then, you know, if you ever change your diet, you travel, you go on antibiotics, there's all kinds of things that can change your microbiome in very acute ways. Your microbiome all of a sudden becomes a different microbiome. And so this longitudinal data really matters. Let's talk about how one measures these things, both in the lab, what you would do, but also maybe for lack of a better word, over the counter and what I could do. If we were interested in understanding your genes, we could do them in a number of ways, right? We could do the gold standard, which was we could do a whole genome sequence. We could sequence every nucleotide of every single coding and non-coding gene in your body. 20 years ago, that would have cost close to a billion dollars. Today, that's about a thousand dollars. Still not the most practical test in the world because it yields a whole bunch of information one doesn't know what to do with, but that's, there's the gold standard. Uh, conversely, we could go on a fishing expedition and you could say, well, I'm, I'm really worried about my risk of cancer. And we could do a commercial test that looks at a whole bunch of known uh, polymorphism SNPs and we could sort of screen for a hundred of those things. It's a much more targeted look and we could get that information. Walk me through the menu of options that you as a scientist would embark on to do this and then what a consumer can do. It's actually quite similar when it comes to understanding the the, the microbiome. So you can do uh, shotgun sequencing where you're getting the entire genomes of all the different microbes, and then you need to be able to assign which genome goes to which microbe, and there's a fair amount of redundancy. And so you use long read paired with short read sequencing to be able to get full the full Tell genome. Tell folks what that is so okay. they understand, yeah, because it's, it's a bit complicated. Um, so it, it's kind of exactly how it sounds. Short read DNA sequencing uh, gives you, so let's, let's assume, let's take a, you know, example, you've got a, a thousand bases of DNA that you want to sequence. Um, what short... By the way, what's typical for um, a, a bacteria has typically how many genes and how many base pairs? It really is a huge range of, of, uh, of sizes. Um, but let, you know, let's, so if you're if you're trying to measure a a, a certain piece of DNA, you can use, use short read sequencing technologies, which allow you to, with high accuracy, get these short pieces of your your sequence. So you get maybe 200 base pairs, and so you would have a few of these, and then you paste them together based on kind of the, the overlapping. Yep. Yeah. And each piece is, is pretty accurate in terms of the, the sequence. Then you can do long read sequencing, which will allow you to get in one shot that entire thousand base pairs, but that tends to be a, a slightly lower fidelity read. And so you might have some errors in there. And so that's why kind of the best way to do it is to do both. And I would say the reason that that's the, the stitching together is problematic is because um, bacteria have redundant genes. And so some bacteria might have, you know, five copies of a gene versus another bacteria that has 10 copies of a gene. And it turns out it matters. And so, um, oh man, I'm not going to remember the name of this bacterial strain, but um, there is a strain that's been studied pretty well that um, metabolizes digoxin. Uh, and uh, A drug that's used to treat arrhythmias. Yes. And... Um, and one of the reasons why that drug fell from being first line is because the efficacy sort of had such a wide, broad range across people. So it's hard to know what's the right amount to, to prescribe to somebody. Wait, does it treat arrhythmias or heart failure? It's heart failure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, that's how long I've been away from the game. <laughs> um, and and I'm no clinician, so I but but. What they found was that there's a microbe that can metabolize digoxin. And so people who needed higher doses to have efficacy yep. had higher amounts of this strain. But then in a, another double click of that, it wasn't just that strain. It was how many copies of this particular gene that it had. So if it had over five, wow. it could metabolize digoxin. Less than five, it couldn't. And that means that that bacteria exists high in the GI tract, presumably, because if that were just something in your cecum or, or beyond, presumably it wouldn't have impacted it. I mean, it has to be somewhat in proximity to the liver to, 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 uh, uh, it have such an impact on the bioavailability of that drug, right? 
I can't remember now. Now I really don't know where it is, but I think isn't digoxin an orally? Yes. Cons- yeah. So, um, I, yeah, I actually don't remember the location of this bacteria, but I, I remember this part about the number of genes being important as to whether it could even metabolize a thing or not. Because normally we think a lot about the num the the different genes in the P four P four fifty system in the liver, which is heavily responsible for how most drugs are metabolized, and that clearly explains a lot of the variability in human metabolism of drugs. But I'd never. I never knew about this. This is even one step beyond that and obviously not dependent on our genome, but the genome of this host. Yeah. And these are mostly gut microbes. So it really is, especially for these oral um, uh, drugs, there is some inter- or some you know path that it takes where it's interacting with these microbes and they are able to metabolize um, these various drugs. But so kind of getting back mm. to your, your sequencing question, the number of replicates matter. So if you imagine you have these short snippets and you, you're sort of, it's sort of a guessing game as to, um, well, gee, is this an actual just replicate or was it only there was one it a time? Second one? Yeah. Exactly. And so that's why you need the kind of the long, long sequence. sequencing. So you can, it sort of becomes your template to put these short reads on. Um, that costs several thousand dollars per sample to do. And so it's it's even today. Even today, because you're you're really trying to get a comprehensive and then just imagine that and now it's every bacterial strain out there. And PS there's a lot of redundancy in bacterial strains. And we also, you know, for a, a large number of them, we don't even know much like the human genome, we don't even know what are, are these real bacteria, what do they do? Um, and so there's just still a lot of kind of uncatalogued genes. And so um, it's a, that's a real endeavor. And then, then the, the second way is to really look at um, a qPCR based uh, where you're really looking at a specific strain and you're trying to understand how much of that exists. Tell, tell folks why the PCR would work that way, like what you have to use and how you have primers and why that's kind of analogous to the let's look at your cancer genes approach. Yeah, so you might have a, um, uh, you know, a lot of bacterial strains kind of in your ecosystem, but you don't know how they, how much they are relative to each other. So you can get a catalog of everything that's in there, but you don't really know how much of each one is in there from these sequencing methodologies. Um, although there are some really interesting tools that people are starting to develop to try to get at that. But the more accurate way to get at the quantitation or how much of this strain is actually in the microbiome is this quantitative PCR. You basically make primers that are specific to that strain, and then you're using PCR in a quantitative way to understand, well, how much of it is in there compared to, say, some other strain or compared to the the entirety of all the different bacteria in there. And now you have an idea of, is this constituting 1% of my microbiome, 10% of my microbiome? And so you get this sort of quantitative piece. If you're low in specific microbes or specific functions, this becomes the way that you would really look at that. There's an added very important complexity that the microbiome has that the human genome doesn't have, and that's around this replication and ever-changing thing. And so it's really not good enough, as we talked about with the Human Microbiome Project, it's not good enough to get one snapshot in time. You really want to understand what is your baseline microbiome, and then you know if you ch- ever change your diet, you travel, you go on antibiotics, there's all kinds of things that can change your microbiome in very acute ways your microbiome all, becomes, all of a sudden becomes a different microbiome. And so it really, this longitudinal data really matters. And then additionally, because every microbe is replicating at a different rate, the um, the the constitution or the, the fraction in which one microbe might be in your gut today might be different tomorrow. And so you you need longitudinal data that gets you the quantitative piece plus, you know, who are the players? And then the third part is because they're also mutating, you need to understand mm-hmm. what did the functions change. So if you really want to understand the microbiome, I mean, we were spending, you know, five to six thousand dollars per sample to understand longitudinally what's happening, what are the different functions, how are these things changing? Um, so it's pretty hard to do. And what are the ideal functional assays? Because I think it's important that we don't lose sight of what actually matters. It's what clearly matters when we look at our cells. Um, I think we're really understanding that today in, in, in humans that function matters more than genome. So it's, you know, the protein is more important than the gene. Um, what do we look at in the gut biome? Are you looking at secretory products? How are you determining the health of the function versus just the genome, which obviously must be correlated with it, but not exact, right? Yeah, we're um, 
We are super interested in carbohydrate metabolism. And so we look at the output of that as the short chain fatty acids. So butyrate, propionate, acetate. And so you can take an individual strain, feed it a substrate, depending on, you know, where in that biochemical pathway it is, its substrate might be slightly different. And then look at how much of those small molecules are being produced on a gas chromatographer. And so we're essentially looking at you're you're running a um, enzymatic reaction. If you think about the the yeah. the, the bacteria as the enzyme, you're giving a substrate and you're basically doing uh, your your old fashioned uh, Michaelis met met curves where you're you're giving it increasing amounts of substrate and you're basically looking at the um, uh, the enzymology of going from substrate to that uh, short chain fatty acid. So let's use that as an example, right? So uh, you eat a piece of bread, starch, polysaccharide. Um, digestion, of course, begins in the mouth. Amylase starts to break that down. It continues further in the stomach. By the time it gets to, God, the, you know, the jejunum, I mean, it's mostly just glucose monomers, right? Well, I think that's still being figured out, actually. What is the... Um state of affairs when things arrive. I mean, it's actually really hard to survey what's happening in the gut microbiome because we don't have good sampling methodologies. And so um, people are, I think, working pretty hard to figure out, can they make- That's super interesting. So you're saying even if you dropped like in, you know, a tube down somebody's throat and you just sampled the slurry at the distal end of the duodenum or at the proximal end of the jejunum, presumably that's kind of a you know, I mean, I've seen what it looks like we see when you operate on somebody. We can't tell what the composition of matter is there? I think the problem, and this isn't, I'm not squarely in this, but I haven't seen anything pop out that was really compelling. Mm. The problem, the, 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 the pushback all of those technologies get is the ease with which things can get contaminated. And so essentially you might be able to get a sample, but then in the process of pulling that back out, it gets, ex it, it kind of becomes contaminated with the other things that are along the track. And it so- It can be done intraoperatively. Could potentially be right, done. Right, right. That would be. Yeah. I mean, that, anyway. Ho hopefully, someone is doing that, right? Because, like, it, you know, if you're if you're in there operating, otherwise, now the problem is you wouldn't be operating on somebody without a bowel prep, and so you've completely destroyed the system. Yeah. That, that also, would... you're not operating on somebody in an anaerobic chamber. <laughs> Those strains might. The second be... they get exposed to oxygen, yeah. it's sort of different. Uh -huh.